Open the door, police. Open the door, police. Open the door, police. Welcome to part three of the Aussie Radio Pirate series, where we look at various illegal transmissions over the decades. If you haven't seen them already, part one covered the 1920s to the 1940s, with the 50s and 60s in part two. Now we come to the 70s and 80s, an era that many here will remember and may even have participated in. We left the 60s when the Beatles were swinging and the youth couldn't get enough pop music on the air. It was also the time of conscription for the increasingly unpopular Vietnam War. Moratorium protests were held in city streets and on university campuses with support for draft resistors. Pirate station 3GR, 3 Draft Resistor, occupied the Melbourne Uni Admin Building to support the Draft Resistors Union protests in opposing conscription. The occupation lasted three days and three nights before 150 police stormed into the building. The transmitter, though, was well hidden and not found by police. Australia in 1970 had only ABC and commercial radio. Many from the protest and campus movements went on to be involved in legal community radio, which started later that decade. 3CR and other stations continue to this day. Then there is the clamour for personal communication, whether for business or fun. Straight-laced editors of magazines like Electronics Australia tut-tutted about radio piracy and didn't publish 27 MHz circuits. Yet they carried advertising from dealers like Sydney's Peter Chalet, who imported Japanese walkie-talkies in large numbers from the late 1960s. The first walkie-talkies were typically single-channel 100 milliwatts. Even these needed a license to use. Users had to demonstrate a need and pay a license fee. You couldn't just buy one and use it for casual chit chat. These handphones were legal for specific purposes like bushwalking. Common frequencies included 27.240 and 27.620 MHz. Despite stern advertisements from the authorities about the fines if caught, many people apparently bought and used these transceivers. Walking both sides of the street, magazines gained from those too in the advertising dollars. Walkie-talkies were getting more powerful with 300 milliwatt and then 1 watt output, and then with the option for more channels. Sales must have been good, as Peter Chalet advertised nothing but walkie-talkies and got distributors in other states. The first walkie-talkies just covered one and then maybe two or three channels with two expensive crystals per frequency. But refined frequency synthesis techniques soon enabled more frequencies with fewer crystals. By the mid-1970s, American 23-channel mobile CBs were available, but still illegal to use in Australia. Peter Chalet benefited from a law that allowed importation but not use of these radios. He taught Dick Smith how to import from Japan. Dick Smith became a major importer in his own right, and one of the few retailers to survive the 1970s CB radio boom. Despite, or maybe partly because of illegality, people's appetite for communication expanded. Kids got better jobs and upgraded from 1 watt handhelds to 5 watt mobile units and ground plane antennas at home. They could talk to adult strangers even further away 
and many friendships and deeper were formed. Some got into CB for the social aspects, with it lacking amateur radio's high entry barriers, there being no novice amateur licensing at the time. And motorists, especially truck drivers, saw value in CB for the road safety aspect, or just as likely to avoid speed cameras. In 1977, a group of Melbourne pirates went up to Mount Dandenong and did a high power 27 megahertz broadcast lampooning the authorities and radio inspectors. With a script and advanced sound effects, it sounded like it had been produced by DJs on their day off and after a bit to drink. The content was risque and inspectors like David Gold and Rodney Champness were mentioned by name. Recordings of Radio FU2 eventually got put on YouTube, and I'll have the links below. Ladies and gentlemen, pirates and Thank you, my son, and let me thank all of you for coming into this gathering tonight, and may God be with you. What do you blokes think you're doing? What's it look like we're doing, Ducky? We're having a cup of tea and some donuts. Well, I'm a radio inspector, and here's me son. I haven't come to look at your transistor radio. I've come to serve a warrant on all of you. Around this time, calls for CB radio's legalisation got louder. At the time, 27 MHz was a poorly used amateur band like it was in New Zealand for quite a bit longer. Although there were amateurs like Sam Voron in Sydney who used 27 megahertz to recruit pirates to amateur radio. CB sets were widely available. It had entered popular culture through American TV shows and pirate activity was rife. Radio inspectors were out knocking on doors and fining people. But the number of pirates was too big to ignore, as was the millions of dollars worth of equipment already in the country. Electronics Australia magazine reviewed a transceiver it coyly described as CB style in its June 1977 issue. The government buckled in June 1977, legalising existing 23 channel sets with a rather expensive $25 license fee and allocated call signs. This was the quick fix, with commencement on the 1st of July 1977. As for new CBs, the government drew up a standard based on an 18-channel plan. Most of the 18 channels were on the same frequencies as the thousands of American 23-channel radios. Thus, equipment was mostly compatible, but with different channel numbers. Only 18 channel CBs were legal to use from January 1978, with the minister having to warn people against buying 23 channel radios. 
but thousands of people kept using them as if nothing had happened. VK amateurs were kicked off 27 MHz from 26th of July 1977. Thus, there is nearly a month where newly legal CBers shared frequencies with amateurs. And before CB was legalised, suppliers could describe 23 channel sets as amateur transceivers. Holders of the then new novice amateur licence were given 500 kilohertz on 28 MHz in exchange for losing their 27 MHz frequencies. A uniquely Australian 477 MHz UHF CB band was also permitted in 1977, with the government saying that 27 MHz users would move to UHF within five years. That's what mostly happened in the long term, but in the short term it proved wishful thinking. But in 1982, the 27 MHz devotees got their way, with the band made permanent and expanded to 40 channels as per the American pattern. This also meant that those with old 23 channel sets could use all their channels again. Initial CB regulations had restrictions on base station antennas, and the authorities wanted CB to be a short range radio service. But they didn't count on one of the best ever solar cycles that was starting its rise. And they didn't really appreciate that huge distances were possible even from low power mobile transceivers. Although legal, CB still had some issues. A young driver was banned from driving any car with a CB radio as he was seen using one while driving. And Tasmanian MP Bruce Goodluck said that organised drug, prostitution and burglary rackets were using CB radio to coordinate their activities. The article's writer, though, was dismissive of the MP's concerns, pointing out that postal and telephone services had also long been used by criminals. CB radio was the first electronic social media. It was the first time that children could speak to strange adults without their parents' knowledge. Use dropped with mobile phones in the 1990s, but its equipment kept getting cheaper, especially UHF. The result is a switchover from 27 MHz to UHF, though far slower than the authorities in 1977 planned. However, there remain diehard enthusiasts on 27 MHz SSB, for whom the coming solar cycle will offer a boost. An amateur who loses their licence but keeps transmitting is also a pirate. Sydney's most famous example is the late Robert Lear, VK2ASZ, amongst other call signs. He was a technically smart ham who abused amateurs via two metre repeaters for years. He had his licence cancelled by the minister in 1985 but kept returning. His harassment extended to the legal system where he was a vexatious litigant suing other hams on made-up claims. Leah died broke and homeless in 2005. Leah's sad story can be found on Ziggy Zapata's website. It's proof that despite claims to the contrary, not even essay-style theory exams and Morse tests can keep the real cretins out. Commercial FM radio started in about 1980. The big AM to FM conversions weren't to start until about 10 years later, after AM stereo failed to win acceptance. That meant a window of about 10 years where lots of people had FM radios, but there are still lots of spare frequencies, even in the capital cities. 
It was quite cheap to build an FM transmitter with people getting a taste from Dick Smith or Talking Electronics kits. And people found that not much power could go a long way if they were high up. So it was not surprising that some took it to the next level, starting FM pirate stations. A Melbourne example was Radio Uranus in 1986 and 1989. Clips of some of its transmissions appear on YouTube. Pirate Radio, Radio Uranus, transmitting on a frequency of 93.7 megahertz, and uh, we're around about in the King Lake area. Uh, for you techno heads, we're running uh, transmitter power of 10 kilowatts um, into a very large antenna beaming straight down onto Melbourne. So um, we hope you're enjoying the music this afternoon and uh, we hope you'll stay tuned in for the next 39 hours because uh, that's how long we're staying on, either that or until uh, someone comes up and turns the power off. But uh, either way, um, I'm sure you're going to have a great time. Earlier that decade was Radio Zerus, which was a Greek pirate from Sydney. No information except what you see on the screen. I remember reading about another 80s pirate, but on the other side of the country in Perth, called 88FM. But a search has failed to find anything. And back in Melbourne, there is an AM pirate on 1611kHz in the 80s around Christmas or New Year's Eve. You couldn't do that now, as these frequencies are full of narrowcasters. But that's close enough to the band to have been tunable on most AM receivers. This may or may not have been the same people who did AM transmissions from Werribee Sewerage Farm on New Year's Eve. So that's it, our look at 1970s and 1980s pirate radio in Australia. If you know of any more examples, or better still were involved, then let us know in the comments below.